Shalom from the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis University. My name is Jonathan Sarna. I direct the Schusterman Center, and it is really my great pleasure to welcome you to the Saga of the Citron, Historical and Global Perspectives, co-sponsored with the Historical Society of Israel and the International Association of historical societies for the study of Jewish history. This is really an historic occasion in its own right, for we are deploying the latest technology to link together in real time scholars of Judaica from around the world. We hope that this proves to be the first of many collaborations of this kind between Israeli and diaspora scholars and institutions ushering in a new era of transnational Jewish scholarship and cooperation. We have set aside time for questions at the end of the program. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce my collaborator and co-conspirator in this undertaking, Professor Shmuel Feiner, Chairman of the Historical Society of Israel and Professor of Modern Jewish History at Bar Ilan University. Shmuel. Okay, Toda, Shalom. Dear guests and colleagues, Welcome to this special event, an academic virtual meeting with speakers and audience from two continents who are going to discuss the saga of the Etrog. I'm honored to represent the expanding community of historians in my capacity as the chair of the Historical Society of Israel, while significantly transforming the way the past is considered investigated, the community is proud to follow the footsteps of the founding fathers who established in 1924 Jerusalem, the Ethnographical Society. The founders were Professor Ben Sion Dinu, a Zionist activist, educator, historian, and Israeli politician who was born in the Russian Empire, and Professor Yitzhak Baer, a prominent historian and an expert on medieval Spanish Jewish history who was born in Germany. Exactly 70 years ago, following the establishment of the state of Israel, the society changed its name to the Historic Society of Israel. Our founding fathers stated that the historical science is seeking the truth and never, never backs up from its results and does not give up to any method or opinion. In an age of alternative truth, conspiracy theories, political attempts to limit the academic freedom and to control historical narratives and fundamentalist attacks on the academia, the mission of the historians who are committed to the critical study of the past is becoming more and more crucial and meaningful. The future historians will no doubt have a lot to say about our times. We who are witnessing on a daily basis the global crisis of the pandemic and the erosion of democracy in many, in many countries, including Israel and America, do not have yet the perspective to understand its historical meaning. But we all recognize the potential of those turbulent times which enable us to reach out to wider public using the Zoom and web webinar technology. The crisis caught us in the historic society while we have been working on our proposal to host the 2025 Congress of the ICHS in Jerusalem. To those of you who do not know, every five years the huge conference of thousands of historians takes place in a different city. We usually organize their special panels on Jewish history under the International Association of Historical Societies for the Study of Jewish History. And now we in Jerusalem would like to give this association a new life and to initiate more and more international events under its umbrella. We believe that this is the right time to get closer, to encourage meetings between historians all over the world and to build a global academic community. This long introduction explains the idea behind the today's event. I'm so grateful to Professor Sarna, 
who approached my proposal with much enthusiasm and suggested to dedicate the first meeting to the original a fascinating project about the atoll. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Professor Josh Toplitsky, who joined us. It was a pleasure working with you and with Anna and Seela. I hope this event is the pilot, which will inspire many, many others. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening. The etrog is a curious fruit. The Bible commands its readers, and you shall take for yourselves on the first day of the festival of Sukkot, the beautiful tree fruit. From the earliest Jewish literature, the identity of the beautiful tree fruit was something of a puzzle. And even after this fruit was identified with the etrog, it posed many challenges for Jews. Native to the Far East and adapted to the culture of the Eastern Mediterranean, the rituals of the etrog are among the very few that are dependent upon a particular environment for growth. But the Jewish religious tradition maintains in its dispersal an indispensable part of the annual rhythms of the Jewish harvest festival, Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. The story of the etrog is a story of Jewish experience in microcosm. Its history involves mobility, accommodation, tradition, creativity, and change. Although the etrog is but one of the four species of agricultural produce associated with the festival, it was often singled out with distinction. More difficult to attain or substitute than the other four species, it prompted creative solutions for procurement and provoked religious controversies and challenges. The etrog has also held a place in Jewish visual and material culture. Coins and, medall and medallions of ancient Jewish commonwealths bear images of this fruit, deemed unique enough to represent this people in its sovereignty. Depicted alongside the other species in two-dimensional manuscript and print arts, the fruit's fragile but indispensable stem, its pitam, required special care that eventuated in boxes and cases that have been and continue to be ornately designed in the three-dimensional arts, a tradition that continues into the present with the works of contemporary experimental artists. In some rabbinic and mystical traditions, the etrog represented the intimacy of the heart. Yet for others, the etrog could be an unruly fruit, sowing seeds of discord and rebellion. During the Second Temple period, when King Alexander Dunes inappropriately made an offering at the temple during Sukkot, the onlooking crowd of Jews pelted him with etrogim in their hands. Etrogim could also represent obstinacy. Christian observers of Jewish tenacity in early modern Europe wrote of the failure of efforts to convert the Jews, noting that, quote, Jews who remain sincerely within the Christian religion are rarer than citrons in Muscovy. Still, etrogim could be salutary. Documents from the Cairo Geniza reflect the uses of etrogim to remedy weak eyesight and migraines. Jewish folk traditions from Central and Eastern Europe encouraged women in labor to bite off the stem of the pitam to ease childbirth. When plague ravaged Padua in 1630, a chronicler observed people carrying etrogim under their noses to avoid the stench of the city and to block inhalation of noxious vapors. And finally, in 1908, when the famed Yiddish author Shalom Aleichem contracted TB and went to take the waters in Italy, he reported to his eager readers that he was following the advice of doctors and going to, quote, where the esrogim blossom. And so I hope that we too might find the curative powers of the study of the etrog as the world weathers a global pandemic in our own time. Today's event is the first fruits, the Reshit Bikurim, of a series of intellectual activities uh, that I am delighted to introduce, and a teaser for a forthcoming exhibition and a book entitled Be Fruitful, the Etrog in Jewish Art, Culture, and History, which is being brought together by a team comprised of Sharon Mintz, Curator of Jewish Art at the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Warren Klein, Curator at the Temple Emanuel Museum in the city of New York, and myself. Each of the lectures that you'll hear today will be featured in the forthcoming volume, and an expansion of their presentations will be available for you to read and enjoy on your own. Today, we'll enjoy but a taste of their research, and it's my honor and pleasure to introduce all of the speakers for you today. Uh, they all have lengthy, wonderful accomplishments, and I'm going to limit uh, to just a few words in order to give them as much possible, as much time as possible to share their thoughts with you. 
Our first speaker this afternoon and evening will be Deborah Kaplan. Professor Deborah Kaplan is an associate professor in the Israel and Golda Kashitsky Department of Jewish History and director of the Halpern Center for the Study of Jewish Self-Perception at Bar Ilan University. Her most recent book appeared just a few weeks ago, and I'm honored to have it uh, on my desk. Uh, it is titled The Patrons and Their Poor, Jewish Community and Public Charity in Early Modern Germany from the University of Pennsylvania Press. Her talk is titled Communal Etrogim, Social Status and Social Discipline in Early Modern European Jewish Communities. Professor Kaplan's lecture will be followed by Zev Elif. Zev Elif is Associate Professor of Jewish History at Turo College and Chief Academic Officer of Hebrew Theological College in Skokie, Illinois. He's the author editor of nine books and more than 40 scholarly articles in the field of American Jewish history. And his most recent book also from 2020 is Authentically Orthodox, a tradition bound faith in American life from Wayne State Press. His lecture is titled The Etrog Trade in the New World. Our third lecturer is Alexander Kay. Alexander Kay is the Carl, Harry and Helen Stoll Chair of Israel Studies and an assistant professor in the Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies at Brandeis University. Alexander Kay also has a brand new book fresh off the presses called The Invention of Jewish Theocracy, The Struggle for Legal Authority in Modern Israel, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. And his lecture is titled The Etrog Exception, Balancing Halakha and Socialism on the Religious Kibbutz. Finally, we have the good fortune to be treated to a comment on all of the papers by Professor Christine Hayes. Professor Hayes is the Weiss Professor of Religious Studies in Classical Judaica at Yale University. A specialist in Talmudic Midrashic Studies, Professor Hayes is the author of multiple scholarly books and articles and a recipient of numerous awards in recognition of her work. Professor Hayes is active in professional and academic organizations and has most recently served helming as the president of the Association for Jewish Studies. Each of our speakers today will treat but a single aspect of the long and global history of the Etrog, but in so doing, they will harvest for us stories of the Etrog from disparate archives, intellectual approaches, and geographic histories. Let us begin. Professor Deborah Kaplan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful event and this wonderful project. And good afternoon and good, good evening to all of our participants from the various places from which you join us. Before I begin, I would just like to acknowledge that my portion uh, of the Etro project and my presentation this evening is part of a joint project that I had the pleasure and privilege of working on with my dear friend and colleague, Professor Edward Fram of Ben-Gurion University. And so the fruits of our labor um, will be um, presented to you by me tonight. <clears throat> As Professor Zaplitsky just told us, the Etrog is a wonderful window for seeing the impact of history on ritual life uh, and specifically the question of environment. And what I would like to do is to begin just by transporting us back to a very different time and place and most of all, a very different climate. And I will be focusing on Germany, mainly in the early modern period from the 16th through the 18th centuries, but I will start my remarks already in the 12th century. And the reason that climate is so important is, of course, because the four species are fruits. And when we think about them, uh, we have to think about the climate in which they grow. And when we think about Germany, the climate in Germany is such that three out of the four species simply do not grow there. While the willow is available, the citron, the myrtle, and the palm frond do not grow there and therefore needed to be imported to German lands, to the Ashkenazic Jewish communities in medieval and early modern times. And importing was certainly not the way it was now. They did not have Amazon Prime Etrogim or anything of the sort. It definitely was a challenge, particularly in times of war or plague. If we look at sources dating back to the 12th and 13th centuries, for example, we see rabbis who faced all kinds of, of, of uh, difficulties and ruled that perhaps it was permissible to use a dried love, a dried palm frond, and even dried myrtle in order to fulfill the commandments because even though this was not an optimal situation, it was nevertheless what was possible under the circumstances where fresh uh, palm fronds and myrtles could not be found. We have other uh, examples of rabbis even considering whether one could bless uh, 
blessed the three of the species if the etrog was unavailable. And so Rabbeinu Tam, in what became a minority opinion in the 12th century in France, actually ruled that on the second day of the holiday, it was permissible to recite a blessing over the myrtle, the palm from, and the willow if one did not have a citron. And this is just as an introduction to give you a sense as to how challenging and how difficult it could be in these times to import these fruits into certain Jewish communities. And this was true of all kinds of fruits and vegetables that were part of rituals, not simply um, the citron. So if you think of another ritual with which we're all familiar, the Passover Seder, many people are used to eating the white horseradish root as part of the Passover Seder. But this was a later custom that was adopted in European communities in which the green leafy vegetables were not available in March or April, and therefore they had to find an accommodation of the kinds of vegetables that grew. This was also true not just in Jewish communities, and if we look at Christian communities of the time, they faced similar problems. What we have here on the slideshow is an image from Vienna in the 15th century depicting Jesus's entry into Jerusalem, which was commemorated on Palm Sunday. And what had been traditional was to use palms, similar to the palm fronds used on Sukkot. And if you look carefully at the bottom of the image, you will see that instead of palm fronds, what you actually have here are palm willows. As I said, willows did grow in Europe and we don't have um, palm fronds readily available. So both Jews and Christians faced this shortage. Now, when we think of the four species, of the four, the most complicated one was the citron, which is the subject of our talk this evening. And this was not only because it was more difficult to preserve the etrog and it could not be used dry the way that a palm frond could be or the way that a myrtle could be used in a dry manner, even if that was not optimal, but also because it was extremely expensive, even when those could be imported and brought in often from Italy and other Mediterranean lands it was still very, very expensive for individuals to purchase an etro. So there was a dual challenge. Just to give a sense, pricing is something that's really, really hard to find in the archives. But we have a few examples, and I'm bringing one this evening from the port city of Hamburg in the 18th century. You have an image here of the city. And it's the year 1715 in Hamburg, the estimated price for four communal etrogim. In a moment, I'll talk more about communal etrogim. But the price for the four etrogim was 12 Reichstaler. What does that mean to us today? The price of 10, flowers, 10 pounds of flour in wheat was 19 shilling, the equivalent of 0.4 rest teller. And just to make the math a bit easier, what this means is that four citrons, four etrogim, cost the same amount as about 300 pounds of flour. So not the kind of thing that a poor person could, could afford, not the kind of thing that many people could afford. When we think about the price of importing them and the price of procuring them, it was very, very difficult for individuals to use an etrog. And this brings me to the main focus of my talk this evening, which is the communal etrog. What to do when there aren't many etrogim, when it's difficult to import them, and when they're unaffordable? Well, the solution seems clear. Get a communal etrog. In some communities, it was one etrog. In some communities, it could be three or four or five, even six etrogim, depending on the size of the community. And this is something that we can look at communal ordinances and see how the amount of communal etrogim uh, <clears throat> shifted over time. Uh, in correlation to the, per, the population of every community. But these were etrogim, citrons used by the entire community. Now, as Professor Zaplitsky mentioned in his remarks, the verse in the Bible commanding people to uh, recite the blessing on the four species said, and you shall take for yourselves. This created a Jewish legal requirement that everybody had to purchase the four species for him or herself, and therefore, what happened with the communal etro was that it became a kind of tax. Every individual in the community who was an official member of the community was expected to participate in the purchase of the communal etro game and then, of course, be allowed to use them. And what you have before you is a wonderful document that I found in the archive just before the lockdown. And it is um, a list of, of um, all the people who paid this etro tax, an etro settle, for those of you who can make out the Yiddish in the manuscript a list here of everyone in the community and how much they paid on this side of the slide toward the communal etro. And it was part of their tax. The amount you paid towards the etro and the communal etro was commensurate with your net worth. And here in what I've blown up here, it's just an image that indicates that the widows, the female heads of household also participated in this tax. And also, as we shall see, uh, used the communal etro ritually. Now, what's interesting about this is that once we have a communal etro, 
And everybody is very much required to, to pay it as a tax. In fact, we have court cases from communities such as Metz in which um, individuals who failed to pay their share of the communal etrog were actually sued by the Jewish community and brought to rabbinical court. Almost always, the rabbinical court ruled in favor of the community, mandating that even those who had purchased individual etrogim for their own use still had to participate in this tax to buy the communal etrog. If we think about, again, the price of an etrog, the community depended on everybody's uh, participation and financial contribution toward this purchase. But once we have a phenomenon of communal etrogim, once we have this idea that it is not just an individual ritual item that a person has, but a communal item, it becomes invested with a certain extra layer of significance. And what we can see in the early modern period especially is that the etro becomes a sort of status symbol. And what I'd like to do is briefly take us through a few examples in which the etro becomes a symbol of your social standing within the community. I will begin with looking at the community of Worms in the 17th century. And this, I'll speak about the image in one moment. Um, this community had three communal etrogim. And uh, what I'd like to discuss now is the use of the communal etrogim. The text that I'll be reading from, which is in front of you on your slide in translation from the Hebrew, is from the custom book of Yus Shamash, the sexton of the Worms community in the 17th century. And he explained, the three communal etrogim are arranged with a myrtle and willow according to the law. And the most important of the etrogim is for the cantor. So of the three etrogim, of the three citrons, the most important one went to the cantor for use in the synagogue. The use of the two others is sold every morning of the holiday. And whoever purchased the communal etrog sends it to his wife in the women's synagogue at the conclusion of the halal prayer. This is the prayer of Psalms that is said while the etrog is being recited and used ritually. And she takes it and recites the blessing first, and after her, the other women in the order of the seats in the synagogue. And children do not recite the blessing until all of the heads of households have already done so. So what we see here is a really wonderful uh, depiction of a communal ritual, including men and women. What you see before you in the image is a model of the Worms synagogue. Here on your right, you see the men's synagogue, which was its own building, and the women's synagogue, which was also built in the medieval period. And what's interesting is that there was a wall separating the two with a door that opened for ceremonies such as circumcisions. And what we see here is that in terms of the communal etrogim, people of means were able to purchase the right every morning to be the very first to use the communal etrogim. And then their wives too would be the first in the women's section. And then the etrogim were passed according to the seats. In the continuation of his description, Yus Bashamish also remarks, that it was possible to allow a more important, wiser, or elderly member of the community to go before oneself if one wished, suggesting that the order in which we dust the etro could be seen as somewhat of a status symbol. But certainly what we see here is that the right to use the communal etro first was something that could be purchased often by the communal elite. Now, this was the case not only with communal etrogim, but also with personal etrogim because despite the prohibitive cost of the, of the etrogim in this period, of the citrons in this period, what we do see is that people were also able to purchase their own etrogim. However, usually through the auspices of the community and community ordinances were very strict, really insisting that people obtain their etrogim from the communal system and not from an outside seller. This wasn't the case in every community, especially communities in which there were fairs where individuals could just simply go to the market themselves, such as Frankfurt, but in other Jewish communities such as Hamburg, this was legislated very strictly in communal ordinances. And so the system that developed was that in addition to the communal etrogim, various etrogim would be purchased by the community and then divided up among those community members who could afford it in a lottery system. And the lottery system shows much about the social standing that people had in early modern communities. And I'm going to bring three brief examples. Starting with the community of Worms, which I just described to you, the three nicest etrogim, as we saw, were selected for communal rooms. Then the rabbi selected the next one. And after that, there was a lottery. Every single person who wished to and who could afford to could participate in the, lot in the lottery, regardless of social standing. This was not the case in other communities. So for example, in Altona Hamburg, there were four communal etrogim. These were selected first, and then there were some others that were actually sent out to small towns and small villages nearby 
who were able to obtain their etrogeim through the larger community of Hamburg. After that, various elite members of the community were able to select their citron without participating in the lottery at all. And the lottery was conducted for everyone else in the community. Now in Hamburg, they tried to buy usually about 40 etrogeim. This is something we know from communal ordinances. And if about, I would say six or seven went to the communal etrogeim for the villages and also the main city of Hamburg, what you had was about 35, 36 uh, etrogeim for lottery um, division. And what we see here is something really fascinating because once the elite members of the community, and there are many of them, there are at least 15 or 20 of them, have their etrogeim, there are very few left for everybody else. They, of course, can use the communal etrogeim, but what winds up happening is that those who have etrogeim in the synagogue are the ones who have a high social standing. The same was true also in the community of Metz in the 18th century, where the list of elites to whom, who were excluded from the lottery was far longer than it was in Hamburg and Altona. All people were subject to the lottery according to the communal ordinance, except for the rabbi, the lay leaders, the former lay leaders, the widows of the lay leaders, the charity collectors, and the lay leaders of the small towns in Lorraine. If you think about this, this could number about 30 individuals at my count of how many elite members were listed in that list. And I'm just not sure how many people who were not elite actually did uh, have the opportunity to own their own etrog and to use their own etrog. And so having and holding the etrog was very much a reflection of communal status. At the same time, once we have a situation where there's an object that is so important and such a status symbol within the community, it also becomes an element that can be controlled. And there are many different examples of this. For example, in the community of Metz, which I just mentioned, uh, various ordinances uh, creating rules and regulations for the community were issued. For example, one um, mandating that Jews not seek justice in non-Jewish courts. And anybody who did not listen to this ordinance was to be excluded from many different uh, rituals, also including uh, the ritual of circling the podium with uh, the citron and the four species in hand. To conclude, <clears throat> I would like to look at one more element of communal control. And that is actually an ordinance from Firth in 1770. And you have before you a picture of the Firth synagogue next to the yeshiva. And I'll speak about this court chart in one minute. In this ordinance, the community decided to forbid passing the four species to the women in the women's synagogue in really contradistinction to what we saw in the text from Worms in the 17th century. Instead, they announced in the synagogue every eve of Sukkot that it was forbidden to pass the citrons to the women's section and that lest, as you see here, family members be detained after the prayer service. Now, in the 18th century, in the late 19th century in Germany, we see a broader trend of excluding women from the public sphere, especially in rituals, whether it be funeral processions or other communal processions. And what I think we see here as well is a desire not just to prevent the women from using the etrogeen in the women's part of the synagogue, but also to prevent them from using and reciting the blessing over the etrogeen in this public square, which is where they would have stood when they came out of the synagogue. I don't think people were particularly worried about running home. You can see people in this image um, really eager to talk to their friends, much as the case in many synagogues that we know today. And yet this was an attempt of the community to maintain control. We have many other such examples, uh, which I'm happy to discuss in the questions and answers. But what I hope this brief uh, picture has given you is that early modern communities were very heavily regulated. They were very much about maintaining social order hierarchies and these hierarchies shifted over time. And the etro being a very scarce communal resource, which was invested with this extra layer of significance became a vehicle for expressing these modes of hierarchy, whether gender or socioeconomic within the Jewish community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kaplan. Um, the floor now goes to Professor Zev Ellis. Um, I just need to be able to start my video.
just a quick technical question. If um, I can start my, uh, my video, please. All right. In the meantime, ah, there we go. Terrific. I'd like to begin uh, by thanking the organizers and my co-panelists. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna, with whom I co-authored a chapter in uh, Professor Tablitsky and his co-editor's uh, upcoming book, uh, and to Anna Simpson for helping me navigate these slides. On November 10th, 1813, several weeks after Sukkot, Reverend Gershom Mendes Satius of New York Sheriff Israel Congregation wrote to his daughter in Virginia to ascertain whether she had managed to find an etrog to fulfill the basic ritual obligations of the holiday. In New York, Jews had access to ritually mandated objects. But Satius' daughter and son-in-law had moved from Gotham to explore merchant life in Richmond. In that smaller American locale, Jews tended to struggle to obtain Torah scrolls and even secondhand Bibles. Could they obtain the four species required for Sukkot? Satius' concern illustrates how Jews in the colonial period and the early Republic, for that matter, most often stood at the consumer end of the supply chain within the market for international Jewish goods. Even in New York, Jews generally looked to suppliers of religious commodities abroad to acquire needed ritual items. Later, the question of where to obtain a trogim from the West Indies, from Europe, from California, or from the land of Israel led to controversies. Religion, economics, technology, and politics underlay these issues, and their resolution resulted in a new global Jewish religious economy that, at least for Etrogim, revolved around the land of Israel. How this happened and why expensive imported Etrogim triumphed over cheap domestic ones is my subject today. In the colonial period, the growing number of Jewish settlers in the United States turned to Caribbean citrons. West Indian Etrogim, while plentiful, did not look like the oblong yellowish creviced fruit found in the Mediterranean. According to one 19th century traveler in the United States, the West Indian citrons were smoother and rounder and have a yellowish white color. The unfamiliar appearance of a citron raised questions and limited its appeal to some potential buyers. By the 1830s, several prominent rabbis, perhaps concerned to protect the European etro trade, voiced displeasure over the Caribbean citron's appearance and other halachic factors that, that declared them unfit for use. Next slide, please. The most unusual response to Caribbean etrogam came in 1836 from Rabbi Yaakov Etlinger, who worried that were we to take here in Europe, the species that grew there on the American islands, we would hold it the opposite manner in which they grew, or in mirror image to the standard etrogam in Europe. This reason, Etlinger, might violate the rule of Derach Kedilatan, that etrogim must be held and shaken along with the other species in the manner that they grow. While dubious science, Etlinger's responsum made it possible for those in the new world to continue to use their etrogim, even as it protected the etrogim, uh, the European etrog producers from cheap new world competition. A decade later, Rabbi Solomon Herschel of London reputedly outlawed Caribbean etrogim altogether. In his view, their unusual texture was the problem. He worried that they had been grafted with lemons, something that according to Halakha, rendered them unfit for ritual use anywhere. These rabbinic decisions kept West Indian etrogim out of Europe, where etrogim from the Ottoman Empire had long dominated the market. But in the United States, the much cheaper and easily obtainable West Indian etrogim had held sway in the early decades of the 19th century. So much so that when America's first ordained rabbis arrived from Europe in the 1840s, the opposition to the use of New World etrogim provoked a serious controversy. Next slide. On one side of the debate stood the first ordained rabbi to settle in the United States, Abraham Rice of Baltimore. He staunchly defended West Indian etrogim. If American Jews did not use these etrogim, he worried, 
they would have none at all. Rice's diligent inquiries to the harvesters and distributors of the Caribbean fruit persuaded him that they were in fact fine for use on Sukkot. Many of the Etrogim there grew unattended in the wild, which implied, at least to Rice, they were ungrafted and permissible according to rabbinic law. Rice therefore declared that all rumors that were set afloat against the kashrut of these Etrogim are founded in error and misinformation. Next slide. On the other side of the Etrog argument stood the learned New York Jewish educator, Henry Goldsmith. Goldsmith insisted that the Etrogim he had examined from the West Indies displayed all the signs typically associated with unfit grafted Etrogim. He cited Etlinger's ruling and corroborated his view with Herschel in London. Next slide. The British train widely respected minister of the Danish West Indies colony of St. Thomas, Moses Nathan, offered the final word on the subject, siding with Rice. This in a private letter to Reverend Isaac Leeser, the foremost champion of American orthodoxy, who had published the earlier letters of the debate in his monthly magazine. Tellingly, offered Nathan, it must also be recollected that our Portuguese brethren in Jamaica were presided over for many years by eminent Chachamim. Surely these pious and orthodox persons would not have sanctioned the use of grafted fruit. Next slide. The widespread anxiety concerning grafted etrogen was, on the surface, a debate concerning Jewish law and botany. At a deeper level, though, it also reflected pervasive fears about assimilationist trends in the New World. A grafted etrogue, after all, was an assimilated etrog, an etrog whose pedigree was questionable, halachic status indeterminate, and appearance untrustworthy. It epitomized in the eyes of Europe's most faithful, the Trefina Medina, the unkosher American state as a whole. The ensuing decades saw etrogim of different geographic origins sold in America. Just as local Jews could choose among different rites and synagogues, so they could now choose among etrogim from diverse places. Some came from New York, to New York, excuse me, from the West Indies. Some arrived from the Greek island of Corfu, where the bulk of European etrogim were grown. Others came from Italy, marketed as superior to any that has ever been brought to this country. And still others originated in North America, California in particular, where citrons form part of a citrus industry that was beginning to take root. These different sources of etrogim betoken three mutually exclusive ideas about America's place in the global Jewish economy. Those who demanded European etrogim for Sukkot considered them the most reliable and that America should be part of the European Jewish religious sphere and market. Those who employed West Indian etrogim imagined America to be part of a vast new world religious economy that was distinct from Europe's and as such, its Jewry should use ritual objects produced on its own side of the pond. Finally, those who began to develop the California etrog trade seemed to have imagined that the United States would in time become an independent and totally self-reliant Jewish center. Next slide. The third option often appeared the most viable. Amid the Civil War in 1861, not a single etrog source proved reliable enough to reach besieged New Orleans in time for Sukkot. Some therefore looked to use indigenous citrons in Louisiana. Later in 1866, a ship carrying a trogim from Corfu to America's ports broke down and was delayed. From New York to Texas, Louisiana to Kansas, congregations were sadly disappointed, a New York Jewish newspaper reported, but not more so than the unfortunate importers who on the arrival of the steamer received some splendid Corfu S. Rogan, but alas, too late. Both incidents reminded local Jews of the problem that dependency created. Absent locally grown etrogim, there might be no etrogim at all. And an even more serious problem confronting etrog merchants in the post-Civil War era was the decline of Jewish religious observance. These merchants found far fewer customers for their pricey fruit. Next slide. Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise, in an effort to salvage some vestige of the Sukkot holiday, suggested that alternatives to the costly lulav and etrog be considered. If you have no etrog, no lulav, etc. Oranges, grapes, pears, and apples will do. Not to be shaken, but to be gratefully enjoyed as God's blessing bestowed upon our beautiful land. Instead of shaking, send a nice basket of choice fruit to some poor family or families, and you have done quite well. Be glad, be blessed. But that suggestion too fell on deaf ears. 
During the Jewish religious depression of the 1870s, observance of Sukkot, like so many other Jewish religious practices, plummeted. To be sure, mitzvah merchants like Hyman Sikorsky continued to sell at Trogim along the sacred books on Manhattan's Division Street. But in due time, peddlers and shopkeepers no longer bothered to make the necessary international arrangements to import the ritual objects. Next slide. With the growing number of East European Jewish immigrants to America in the 1880s, the market for etrogim revived. Not only did America's Jewish population swell rapidly, but many of its Jewish newcomers hailed from religiously traditional East European enclaves where the annual purchase of etrogim was taken for granted. In 1888, Rabbi Moshe Weinberger reported that the number of merchants selling at Trogim had increased greatly in recent years, and the competition is now exceedingly great. As a result, the price of a Trogim declined and even poor Jews could afford to purchase one. Next slide. The other new source of a Trogim beginning in 1877 in the United States was the land of Israel. In that year, a scant decade after regular and faster steam, steamship service to Palestine was inaugurated, newspapers announced that in New York, Mr. J.H. Kentrowitz of 31 East Broadway had imported from the Holy Land a choice lot of Esrogan. One editor proclaimed, this is the first time that Esrogan grown in the Holy Land have been sold in the city, and Mr. Kentrowitz's enterprise deserves liberal patronage. A Trogan from the land of Israel lacked the visual appeal of those produced elsewhere. They were small and scrawny, yet carried a hefty price tag. But coming as they did from the soil of the Holy Land, that scarcely mattered. In addition, money expended on the Holy Land etro contributed to the well-being of Palestine's struggling Jewish community. Several factors embedded the growth of the Holy Land etro trade in the United States. First, the reputation of Corfu's etro can decline. Lithuanian luminaries, led by Rabbi Yitzchak Elchan Inspector, charged that Corfu's non-Jewish etrog dealers knowingly mix grafted etrogim with ungrafted ones. Spector, who encouraged a number of his disciples to settle in American communities, called for a boycott of the popular Corfu etrogim. Seeking to break the stranglehold of the island's etrog cartel, he and his allies encouraged the development of new etrog sources, chief among them, the land of Israel. Second, in April 1891, the death of a young Jewish girl in Corfu led to unfounded rumors that local Jewish culpability was involved in the crime. The resulting well-publicized blood libel led to massive anti-Jewish violence, including 22 deaths, numerous injuries, widespread destruction, and the departure of the majority of the island's Jews, between two and 3,000 all told. In response, many Jews boycotted Corfu products, Etrogim included. Next slide. In the United States, the, the vituperative bookseller and Hebrew writer Ephraim Dinard led a campaign in New York against the Corfu at Trogim and in favor of their Palestinian competitors. After the Corfu violence, Dinard vented the full measure of his fury against Corfu at Trogim, publishing a tract distributed free to anyone willing to pay the postage that compared the war against them to the Bible's unrestrained war against the wicked Amalekites. Dinard decried the Etrogim of Corfu as grafted bastard crops and blood-stained ritual objects. A legion of Orthodox rabbis joined Dinard in the battle against Corfu et Trogim. Corfu's et Trog growers never fully recovered from the campaign waged against them. Next slide. In the 20th century, choice et Trogim from Jaffa and Petah Tikva therefore gained in popularity. For a time, during the disruption of global trade occasioned by World War I, some hope that the etrog might be profitably grown on a small scale in some of the citrus sections of Florida and California, but that movement didn't last. For the better part of the last century, the majority of etrogim sold in America were imported at high cost from the land of Israel. Next slide. Today, some three quarters of the world's supply of kosher etrogim come from there. Only a single etrog farmer, who is in his 80s by now, still grows etrogim commercially in California. Etrogim from the West Indies in California, had those markets developed, might have been cheaper and more beautiful, but they could never compete with the symbolic value of owning an etrog grown by dependable Jewish farmers in the holiest soil of the Jewish world. With that, the 19th century debate over the American Jewish community's place in the global religious Jewish economy was effectively settled. When it came to etrogim, at least, the American Jewish community 
would neither be religiously independent nor the major player in a once dreamed of new world trade rooted in the West Indies, nor an importer from Europe. It would be content instead to serve as the prime foreign market for the Jewish etro growers of the Holy Land. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Eller. Our third uh, paper for this afternoon and evening is from Professor Alexander Kay. Professor Kay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Teplitsky. And I, I just want to say, first of all, how just exciting and wonderful this is to be part of this international uh, collaboration um, and um, especially to um, anticipate with great excitement the the Etrog book which is on its way and the accompanying exhibitions and and other events. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is the, um, the way that the kibbutz movement in Israel and in particular the religious kibbutz movement in Israel um, used and thought about the etrog. And in some ways, um, my presentation has a different focus than the previous two because um, both Professor Kaplan and Professor Elef talked about the ways that um, the communities of, the, of early modern Europe and also of um, the New World had to struggle with um, debates over the etrog which were centered on the problem of a lack of supply. In other words, there weren't enough etrogium to go around or they were too expensive or supply lines were disrupted and so on. In my case, the community that I'm talking about, the religious kibbutz movement in um, the late mandate period of Palestine and the early um, state period in Israel, um, had plenty of etrogium. That wasn't the problem. The problem they had was an ideological problem that they had to contend with. And that's what I'm gonna explain in the next few minutes. So let me first introduce to you the community that I'm talking about, which is the uh, religious kibbutz community and uh, tell you a, a little bit about what that is. So um, many people who are familiar with Israel have heard of the kibbutz movement. Um, the kibbutz movement, um, which grew to, um, to have tens, more than 100,000 members at its peak, um, while not, uh, it, was, it was never the case that the kibbutz movement in Israel had most um, of, the, um, of Israel's Jews living in them, um, but they were still a kind of um, a, a, a kind of symbol of the important aspects of Zionism, which was to say um, Jewish nationalism, a return to the land, a socialist um, uh, communal uh, commitment and so on. But the religious kibbutz movement was an even smaller subset of that um, overall movement. And um, I've put here a quotation from Moshe Una, who, is, who was one of the uh, leading intellectual um, and, and political leaders of the religious kibbutz movement in defining what the movement was about. And according to Una, the unique character of the religious kibbutz movement was determined by three principles, religion, Jewish nationalism, and socialism. Now, it, just saying this out loud may seem almost um, banal or not particularly interesting, but in the context of its time, it was actually not just interesting, but um, incredibly unusual and in fact revolutionary. And that is because if we're looking um, at the beginnings of the uh, religious kibbutz movement in the 1930s, um, most Zionists at the time, most Jewish Zionists were not Orthodox. Jews, and most Orthodox Jews were not Zionists in that period of time. So here you have a community of people who are committed both to um, traditional Jewish living, to halakha, and also to Zionism. And, and that, so that characterizes the religious Zionist movement as a whole. But here we have an extra principle, an extra pillar of the community, which is a commitment to socialism, to socialist ideology. So um, who were these people that, that embodied these ideals? I, there's a photograph there in the back of the screen from one of the training camps that the community set up in, um, in Germany still, and um, before they moved to Palestine. Um, and the, um, the German stream of the religious kibbutz movement uh, made up one um, part of its, uh, one part of it, and the other stream came from Eastern Europe, um, from um, 
um, from Jews that had come in from Russia and Poland and, and, and moved to Palestine. And um, so these two streams together formed a religious kibbutz movement that had these principles um, um, w that were guided by these principles. As you can see um, from this photograph, um, it, which is representative of the movement, most of the people that were in the religious kibbutz movement in this period of time were young, Orthodox Jews um, who had broken away from the lives of their parents in many ways. They had moved countries um, and while remaining committed to halachic Judaism that their parents had followed, they had an, a very revolutionary attitude to that, um, to that tradition as we'll see. Now, I, even though, um, even at its peak, the religious kibbutz movement um, was not particularly large, I think that it's actually an incredibly important thing, an interesting thing for people to study today. And that is because it represents what happens when a group of people, in this case, young people, are grappling with synthesizing the different parts of their identity. And in this respect, I think it really does speak to the situation that many um, young Jews and older Jews, but also people in general feel today who are grappling it sounds like Professor K may be frozen. We're going to work this out right away. My apologies for that. I have no idea what happened. Uh, there was a technical glitch. So I'm now I'm on my phone um, and I'm just going to turn off this light, which I think will be too glary for you. And then I'll, I'll continue. So um, as I was trying to say, um, the, and forgive me that you, you don't see my slides right now, but that's, that's okay. Um, so as I'm saying, um, this is a group that um, tried to synthesize these different parts of their lives um, in a way that um, um, put aside the compartmental, compartmentalization that many religious people were feeling between their religious lives and their political lives and, um, and other kinds of commitments. So I want to emphasize that for the members of the religious kibbutz, their um, goal was, an act, was a revolutionary act. In other words, they tried to establish a society that um, brought about what, in the words of one of their founding members who was called Shmuel Chaim Landau, Landau was a Mered Kadosh, which means a holy rebellion. And they took both sides of this phrase very, very seriously. They needed what they would, they believed what they were doing was holy. In other words, that it was connected to the basic principles of their religion and indeed connected um, to the moment of revelation on Sinai itself. But at the same time, it was a rebellion. And what was it a rebellion against? It was a rebellion against what they saw as the bourgeois ossified lives of their parents, whose religious lives in their minds were all about um, money and status and, um, of, and completely gave up on the possibility of, leave, of leading religious lives that were integrated communally. In other words, that people will be connected to each other in a deep way, and that they would also be connected to the land of Israel. Um, and, to, and to achieve that end, they set up these um, religious kibbutzim, which were um, kibbutzim, which means that all of the property held and all of the property that anybody had on the religious kibbutz was not held by individuals, but was held by everybody together. In other words, and this was a communalist um, community. All co property was held in common. Now, what does this mean when we start talking about the etrog? Well, as you've already heard, um, one of the um, halachic rules about the etrog is that the etrog has to be owned by the person who is using it as they are performing the ritual um, that, they're, that they're doing on the festival of, of Sukkot. And this raises a problem. In a community where all property is held in common, how could it be that somebody can own an etrog? Well, there were a number of approaches to answering that question, and um, I'm going to outline three of them. And I think these three approaches um, outline three different ways of thinking about synthesizing tradition and contemporary sensibilities. And um, one of them was to, one of the approaches was to say, um, let's use the precedent that we've already heard Professor Kaplan talk about today of medieval and early modern Jewry. And um, in many Jewish communities in the, in the pre-modern period, there were not enough etrogim to go around. But even though a community may have one or two or three or four etrogim, the person who was doing the ritual at the moment that they were doing it entirely owned the etrog at that moment. And the way that that would be achieved was that when the person took up the etrog to use it, 
And the entire rest of the community that, share, that each had a tiny share in the etrog would implicitly gift their, their shares to this particular individual who would own it in its entirety for the period that they were doing the ritual, and then they would pass it on to the next person, and the entire community would give their shares over to the next person, and so on and so on. And many people on the religious kibbutz thought that this was the ideal um, solution to this problem. After all, um, if one of the ideals of the kibbutz was communalism, was sharing everything together, this was a perfect example of that. The kibbutz should have one etrog or a small number of, of etrogim, and then um, grant the entire use of that etrog to each person as they went around. And for many, this was the best solution. But some thought differently. One um, thinker on the kibbutz in particular, called Meir Or, um, pointed out a problem with that. And it's a kind of a legalistic problem, which I'll just map out for you briefly. On the kibbutz, all property was held in common. Nobody had any private property whatsoever. And in fact, when you joined the kibbutz, you signed a document which said, even if somebody gives you a gift while you are a member of the kibbutz, that gift immediately becomes owned by the entire kibbutz. In other words, you can't own any property. So says Meir Or, in the Middle Ages, the whole community could give their shares in the etrog to a particular individual. But in this case, that wouldn't work because as soon as you accepted the shares of everybody else on the kibbutz, you would, in, you would own it, but you wouldn't own it because you would immediately and, and spontaneously and instantaneously give your shares back to the kibbutz itself. So you could never actually own it, even for a moment, to do the ritual with. And what, what Meir Ara proposed was, rather than um, using all of these medieval loopholes, let's be radical. Let's change the very idea of ownership in halacha itself. In other words, he proposed that whereas ownership in Jewish history and religious history in halachic history meant private ownership. Now that we have gone through this revolution of Jewish socialism, ownership doesn't mean personal private ownership at all. It now means communal ownership. In other words, he proposed a fairly radical change to the halacha to solve this problem. The third approach, and this is an approach that was eventually taken by the kibbutz movement itself, was to create what I'm calling the etrog exception. And that is that essentially there was a change made to the bylaws of the religious kibbutz movement. And in the section which said there can be no private ownership on the religious kibbutz, they added a clause which said, with the exception of those items needed to fulfill mitzvot. And after that, people could indeed own the etrog. Now, I'm going to end by just saying, um, uh, talking about one's reactions, one's possible reactions to that move. On the one hand, this may seem like a, like really giving up. You know, they had a moment where they could um, really struggle with synthesizing religious tradition with their own socialist ideology. And in the end, they kind of threw in the towel and said, let's just make an exception and do things and, 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 and take this off the table as a challenge. Um, and on the one hand, that seems a little bit of a disappointing if you're thinking about purist ideology. But actually, there's an other approach to this, which I was inspired to think about by um, cousins of mine who actually live on a religious kibbutz in Israel called Kibbutz Alumim. Many of you may know that today, the kibbutz movement in general, the religious kibbutz movement, but also the wider kibbutz movement, is moving away from its traditional communalist nature, and increasingly kibbutzim are being privatized one by one and moving away from socialism towards a more capitalist system. And that's happened for many religious kibbutzim. But for some of them, including the kibbutz where my cousin lives, which is called Alumim, as I mentioned, that hasn't happened. And my cousin told me that in the early days, Alumim had a kind of, um, it, was, it was deemed by some of the other kibbutzim to be a little light on ideology to not be as committed, to not be as pure in their understanding of rigid, um, the rigid requirements of, um, socialist, um, of socialist positions. And some of the other kibbutzim kind of laughed at them um, or condescended to them about that. But actually, um, it was that flexibility that enabled the kibbutz to continue, um, this particular kibbutz to continue in its communalist ways. Um, it was what was once sort of mocked in, by some 
as a, an, an abandonment of purist principle was actually what saved the kibbutz and created a flexibility to allow it to continue. So in some ways, the solution, which was the etrog exception, can be, uh, could be seen as an abandonment of principle, but it could also be seen as a way that, that flexibility is one of the ways that people in today's world can come to a real synthesis of different beliefs that they may hold and want to bring them all together into a single whole. Thank you, Professor Kay, and, and special commendations. Thank you for being so flexible and nimble on your feet with uh, returning to us. We were eager to hear the rest of your talk and are glad that you made it back. We're gonna turn the floor now um, for comments and a response on all three of the papers to Professor Christine Hayes. Professor Hayes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I want to add my thanks to those who have thanked the organizers of this uh, wonderful event. And in order to make sure that we have room for um, questions and answers, I'm going to jump right in. So Bar Kochba, who was the leader of the rebellion against the Romans in the 130s of the Common Era, he mentions the Etrog by name when he writes in a letter recently discovered at Nachal Hever that a certain Yehuda Bar Menashe should procure and send the four species to him to serve the large army. Um, as Jeffrey Rubenstein points out, even in the midst of war, the festal, uh, festal obligation could not be neglected. Bar Kochba's letter is evidence that Jewish assiduousness in acquiring the Atrog in adverse conditions, an assiduousness highlighted by two of the papers we've heard today, was not a later development, but a long-standing phenomenon. All of the papers we heard today depict Jewish communities laboring to satisfy two details of the commandment in Leviticus 23.40, the commandment says, and you shall take for yourselves the fruit of goodly trees. The first detail is specified by the word lachem, for yourselves. The verse doesn't say you shall take the fruit of goodly trees, but rather you shall take lachem for yourselves, which is understood as mandating personal ownership of the, of the fruit. And the second detail is specified by the word hadar in the construct chain pri etz hadar, the fruit is to meet some standard of beauty or superiority. It is to be mehudar. How different communities worked to meet these two requirements provides grist for the historian's mill. So consider first the requirement of ownership. When I read the papers by Kaplan and Fromm and um, by Kay, I was struck by the tension between communitarian and individualist impulses and by the fact that different communities managed that tension in ways that both uh, were shaped by and expressive of their very different economic, cultural, and ideological circumstances. So we begin with the fact that requirement of ownership was traditionally interpreted in an individualistic way, as we've heard, as a requirement of personal and exclusive ownership of the Atrog. Yet, as Kaplan um, explained, pressures of cost and availability forced early European communities to early, early modern European communities to adopt a communitarian approach, purchasing one atrog for the community. In some instances, going so far as to prohibit individuals from purchasing their own atrog game outside the community in order to protect the community's investment. This communal purchase, which went against the grain to some extent, would then be defeated by a legal fiction granting temporary individual ownership in succession to each community member performing the ritual. The communal approach, which was forced upon these communities by external circumstances, was further defeated by individualistic practices expressing difference. Systems of distribution of the communally purchased atrogame that reinforced status differences, as well as the permission given to members to distinguish themselves from their fellow community members by purchasing the right to be the first to bless the four species on each day of the holiday. So in the communities surveyed by Kaplan, the ideal of individual ownership of an atrog by every Jew was precluded on logistical and economic grounds. Communal purchase was a concession to this harsh reality, but individualism reasserted itself through a legal fiction and through social practices that valued and affirmed distinct identities and statuses. By contrast, the struggle between communitarian and individual impulses plays out quite differently in the religious Zionist kibbutzim we just heard about. As Alexander Kay shows, for these communities, individual ownership of an atrog by every Jew was precluded on ideological grounds. Communal purchase was not a concession to harsh reality, but a fulfillment of a deeply felt socialist ideal. 
The individual ownership required by the mitzvah was not a desirable element for these communities, but a problem precisely because it, is, it represented an assertion of individual identities and status differences in violation of the kibbutzim's communitarian ethos. Add to that the Zionist rejection of the arcane legal fictions of diaspora halakha and the ability of religious, religious Zionist kibbutznikim to take anything for themselves, whether an etrog or a pair of trousers, through a legal fiction was simply impossible. Something had to give, their socialism or their Torah. And in the end it was, well, I think neither. By ruling that individual ownership would be allowed in the, it sounds like two cases, where the performance of a mitzvah requires personal ownership, the etrog and the wedding ring, the religious Zionist kibbutzim carved out a small exception that proved the larger communitarian rule. If these are the only rituals, bracketed from the religious Zionist project of integrating socialism and halakha, then it proves that socialism and Zionism are not only compatible with halakha, but the very conditions for its fullest realization. A small concession then, entirely worth the wager. In the same way, determining what makes an etrog muhudar of superior status is both shaped by and expressive of economic, cultural, and ideological circumstances. Now, as a term describing fruit, the word mahudar might likely be taken to refer to the fruit's aesthetics, its beautiful appearance and delicious taste. But as we heard today, a fruit that was smooth skinned and particularly juicy, aesthetically pleasing qualities, was at times held in suspicion of being a lemon or worse, a hybrid fruit. Recounting the fate of the New World Atrog, Zev Elif reminds us that mehudar is in the eye of the beholder and that the eye of the beholder perceives through a prism of ideology. Thus, the early American preference for expensive imported European etrogim over cheaper domestic varieties is attributable less to the European fruit's aesthetic qualities, perhaps, than to its purported alignment with the ideals of genealogical and even cultural purity. An etrog that was mehudar was an etrog that was not grafted. A charge frequently leveled at etrogim grown in the new world was that they were grafted. But this was not a mere botanical observation for as Elif observes, the 19th century assertion of the purity of European etrogim in comparison to new world etrogim may be seen as a proxy for larger debates over the diluted and assimilated quality of Jewish life in the Americas. As, uh, as he says so memorably, as a great quote, a grafted etrog was after all an assimilated etrog that quote, epitomized the Trefana Medina, the unkosher American state as a whole. Given pervasive suspicions of the lax standards and assimilationist trends of the new world, one can imagine that the detractors of Californian and Caribbean etrogim would have been all too readily believed when they implicated the fruit as grafted. For their part, the supporters of the new world etrog resorted to researching the conditions of its cultivation in order to certify the lack of grafting. But turnabout is fair play and European etrogim were not immune to the calumny, particularly when a finger could be pointed at non-Jewish etrog dealers unconcerned about the dangers of grafting, as in the case of the etrogim of Corfu. But both the European and the New World apple carts, or perhaps if you can stand one more pun, I should say etrog carts, were to be upset by the unassailable claim to purity advanced by etrog growers in, the, in late 19th century Palestine. Here was a truly mahudar etrog, understood of course, not in aesthetic terms, evidently they were scrawny, but in the symbolic terms that mattered most. These etrogim were grown from pure ungrafted stock by dependable Jewish growers in the most culturally original soil in the Jewish world, the Holy Land. Etrogim of the new world may have been objectively more beautiful, but paradoxically, that did not make them muhudar. And here we return to the first detail um, of the verse with which we began, because as um, Kay tells us, religious Zionists reinterpreted the term lachem for yourselves in Leviticus 2340. Um, and the way they did so, well, the midrashist in me sees in their reinterpretation, both a transposition of the verse and a grammatical play that brings the two elements of lachem and mahudar together. It's as if they read the verse this way, ulakachtem 
Beyom Arishon, Pri Etz Hadar Lachem, transposing Lachem to the end, so that Lachem now modifies the fruit and not the taking. Take on the first day the fruit of goodly trees that are Lachem, in the sense of Shelachem, yours, and in the plural, which is to say fruit that is of your communities, produced by Jewish growers on Jewish soil in the land of Palestine. And now the two requirements, that of ownership and that of superior quality, collapse into one. Take a pre et sadar lachem, the goodly fruit that is from your community. And in this way, then, a fruit that is mahudar becomes, by definition, a fruit that is produced from ungrafted stock by trusted Jewish growers on Jewish soil. The Etrog of Palestine thus fulfilled simultaneously the two crucial elements in the verse, as newly understood by this group. The requirement that the Etrog be lachem, plural, for from your community, and the requirement that it be mahudar, ungrafted by trusted growers. This modern midrash emboldens me to close by recalling a more ancient midrash. Commenting on Leviticus 23's instruction to the Israelites to take up the four species as part of the observance of Sukkot, a midrash in Vayikra Rabbah describes Solomon, Shlomo, the wisest of all Israel's kings, struggling to identify the four species. He struggles despite the fact that he is renowned, so the biblical text tells us explicitly, for his discourses about trees and his botanical knowledge. But according to the Midrash, Solomon sat and wondered about these four species, as it says in Proverbs 30, three things are beyond me, four I cannot fathom. These, say the rabbis, were the four species, which Solomon tried to understand. Fruit of goodly trees, who says this is the Atrog? All trees produce goodly fruits. Likewise, the verse says branches of palms, and yet we take the heart of the palm. Boughs of leafy trees, who says this is the myrtle? And willows of the brook, all trees grow acquire, uh, beside water. And yet, these are the four species which each and every Israelite hurries to acquire to praise the Holy One. And while they seem like trivial matters to human beings, they are important to the Holy One. And I would venture to say that the company assembled today would concur with the Holy One that this is no trivial matter, and that in the hands of master historians, this humble fruit has much to teach us about the complexity and diversity of Jewish cultures across time and space. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Hayes, for, for braiding together the three of those papers and bringing them into, into dialogue and conversation. Um, we're very fortunate that we have uh, the time to, um, to raise questions, and we're even more fortunate that we have a very, very active audience that has been um, furiously adding questions, anecdotes, and personal reflections into the chat box as well, which just confirms that the unexpected etrog is uh, an object of of great interest. Um, so please join me once more um, in thanking all of our speakers for today. Um, I have been doing my best to comb my way through the questions and I'll, I'll try to pose as many as I can to all of our speakers for today. Um, we, we, so as I said, we've had many fascinating questions that have come in. Um, I'll pose some for the group. Um, a question for Professor Kaplan, or rather two questions for Professor Kaplan. Um, one of our, our um, attendees asked if you might speak a little bit more about how the lottery worked. Were there set prices? Was there a bidding war in the communities? How did prices operate um, in that way? Uh, another questioner writes in for Professor Kaplan, if you might, um, you, you've told us something about women's experience, and if you might push us even further and tell us if you can offer us a perspective on the narrowing of women's access to ritual over the course of the 18th century, if that's a trend that you see over the course of the early modern period, and in particular in the 18th century. Uh, a question comes in that bridges some of the uh, matters between Professor Kaplan and Professor Ellis' texts. Um, one questioner asks if American halachists were interested in communal concerns as well. Did they, did they talk, think right about provisions for community, for the poor, for charity? Um, another question, comes in for Professor Cade that asks and invites him to um, offer us context for other comparable uh, religious commandments that belonged to such individual and collective items, uh, such as wedding rings, Hanukkah candles, um, and, to, and to tell us about um, communal ownership as it extended perhaps to personal and religious objects. And then one question that, that uh, another questioner has posed to all of you is to ask, in any of your sources, do you encounter a market for etrogim beyond a Jewish market? 
um, and it's possible that your sources don't allow you access to that. But if you, if you do have that space, um, some of our questioners would be curious to hear about that as well. Um, so we'll begin with Professor Kaplan, and then Professor Elif, then Professor K. Thank you. Okay, I'll do my best to answer quickly. Um, as for the lotteries, most of the sources that I presented this evening um, were prescriptive sources. They're sources that present the ideal rather than describe the reality. And so all of my sources about the lotteries uh, really are, are of that nature. And I only have so a source from one community in which details of the lottery are presented. And that is from also Worms, where we have the most descriptive of the prescriptive sources in the form of the customs book that I mentioned. And there we see that it was a set price with one distinction. Anybody who was lucky enough to get a new palm frond had to pay half a kreutzer more than anyone who, through the lottery system, got a dried out palm frond. Um, otherwise, I don't have any references to any bidding wars, unlike, uh, let's say, the lotteries for Simchat Torah, when honors for throughout the year in the synagogue would be auctioned off to the higher bidder. I don't see that um, with the Etrogim. In terms of women, um, I would actually start out with the very same point. The sources that I've presented are prescriptive sources. They don't tell us whether or not women in the late 18th century communities actually did stop any of their ritual activities, and I have my doubts about that. But what I think we do see, and, and I wanna be very geographically specific here, in the Western part of the Holy Roman Empire, I think we do see an attempt to curtail women's ritual activities in the public sphere. We see that in Halberstadt, we see that in Metz, we see that in Firth, in the example I brought here, in terms of participation at funerals, participations to communal processions, to graves on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, we have uh, ordinances about charitable giving and collection in the synagogue, restricting women's activities. And this really is, to my mind, a very late 18th century phenomenon. I see it mostly at 1769, 1770, um, maybe after 1760. But before that, the sources that we have that are descriptive from before that do suggest that women really are very active in all of these fields, um, certainly earlier in the 17th century. I'm not sure if there was one more thing, Professor Tsipuski, maybe you could, was there anything else I was supposed to answer? Only if you wish to, to mention if any of your sources or anything that you've encountered um, mentions anything about non-Jewish uses of the etrogim. Right. Um, I have not encountered that. And I, I would go farther and say, in one of the archival court cases that I have against a Jewish etrog seller uh, who was banned from the communities of Frankfurt and Firth from selling his wares, when he sues the communities in court for excommunicating him and prohibiting his trade, he implies that that is a total ban on his entire enterprise. So at least he did not feel that he had a market to sell his etrogim outside of the Jewish communities in which he normally traveled. Thank you, that's fascinating. And Professor Elif. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I like the questions of Professor Kaplan. Um, for uh, one interesting, there are, there's a romance around the only communal etrog in, in memoirs in American Jewish life. There was only one etrog in the so-called Chicago Jewish ghetto or on the Lower East Side. Um, that is, it's, it's hard to parse out what, if it actually means there was only one etrog. Certainly there were times where there was just one etrog and uh, it was too expensive for individuals of an entire community to purchase. Other times it, it romantically um, conveys um, the closeness of a community, of a landsman shop. And uh, it, it's, again, it's hard to parse out, but certainly uh, that is the case about um, Ephraim Dinard, um, who I mentioned before, one of his attacks on the Corfu Etrogan, um, other than calling uh, Corfu a bunch of Amalekites, uh, was, um, was the high cost uh, that was associated with it. He was very, so economics, if not in the foreground, was certainly in the background. Uh, one source I didn't um, offer, but Josh, it's in your book, um, is uh, Elkan Cohn, a rabbi in San Francisco. Uh, it became apparently the reform custom in reform communities, this is in Manuel in San Francisco, that there'd be one communal etro. That wasn't, uh, they were actually a well-heeled community, uh, 
Levi's and others uh, were associated, not Levi per se, but other people were associated with that congregation. Um, but the idea of, uh, of one etrog being part of the ritual uh, was very much a part of it. So there you have a decoupling um, cost with one etrog. Um, the other, the question of, of uh, non-Jewish attachment to etrog, not on the consumer side, but certainly on, uh, on the dis distribution side, uh, in which you have uh, materials produced from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and others noting um, how Jews like to purchase around September, October time, these citrons, uh, and a non-Jewish market, obviously in Corfu, that was the discussion, but also in America. Uh, the one uh, harvester right now is 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 not Jewish, um, so what's interesting is that conversation around it, and of course the uh, curiosity of non-Jewish neighbors around lifting uh, the citron and the palm and carrying it to synagogue has always been uh, an iconic memory for Jews and non-Jews alike. Hey, thanks so much. Um, yeah, the, the question of other areas of halakha that, uh, that in which ownership, private ownership is important, absolutely did come up on the religious kibbutz. Um, but they are very limited, as Professor Hayes mentioned before. So, for example, um, Hanukkah candles. Um, you know, the, the custom is for every house to light its own Hanukkah candles. But the Hanukkah candles don't have to be personally owned according to halakha by anybody who's in that house. Um, but the one area of halakha that was very practical and um, occurred a lot on the kibbutz was indeed um, the question of, of the wedding ring. Now this was particularly interesting because on the kibbutz movement in general, which was, don't forget, a revolutionary socialist movement, certainly in many of the regular, the secular, the non-religious kibbutzim, many of those kibbutzim didn't like the idea of marriage at all. And they wouldn't have called it this, but we would today say that it was a patriarchal structure that they wanted to get away from. And this wasn't the case on religious kibbutzim. They, they did ban, they keep the, the, the um, tradition of Jewish marriage and with a, a ring in the, in the traditional way. And the question was how, um, but, but according to traditional Orthodox halakha, um, to get married, a, a bride and a groom, the, bride, the groom has to own a ring entirely and then give it to the bride as part of the ceremony. There are, there are apocryphal stories about this, um, which I, I have a sense of in, 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 this is one of the rare instances where an apocryphal story may actually be true, um, which is that early on, the religious kibbutzim would have a single ring shared by the whole kibbutz, and basically a, a wedding would take place, and the, the, the entire kibbutz would give the ring to the groom, who would then give the ring to the bride, they'd then be married, and then she would give the ring back to the kibbutz again, ready to use for the next couple. And in fact, there was one story of a wedding that was about to take place and the bride and groom were there. The groom had to take ownership of the ring, but to do that, all of the members of the kibbutz had to be present to give the groom the, um, their, their shares in the ring, but they weren't all there. Somebody was off running an errand or something like that. And the wedding was nearly called off until the fellow sort of arrived at the last minute and, and managed to, to participate. Um, so, it, it, and in this example, I think we see also another really important aspect of the religious kibbutzim, which is, which is, which it, which is its relationship to gender equality. In many ways, the religious kibbutz, like the kibbutz movement in general, was a kind of trailblazer when it came to gender equality, and also in the halachic realm. Um, so certainly just in terms of just generally culturally speaking, so uh, women um, would wear sort of short pants on the, on the religious kibbutz um, as a matter of course, which was less common in the wider Orthodox community. And in some, in some cases, the religious kibbutz um, really um, pushed back against the rest of the Orthodox community. In the very early years of the state of Israel, the government essentially fell apart over the question of whether women should be required to do some kind of national service. And most of the Orthodox community overwhelmingly said absolutely not. But the religious kibbutz movement alone in the Orthodox um, community said, no, this is, they absolutely should. This is not a, um, a halachic question. Women should be able to participate fully and so on. So on the one hand, we see that aspect of the religious kibbutz movement, but on the other hand, there are limits to this. Um, there's nobody that I have found that said, let's overturn the entire status of marriage or make marriage a, an entirely egalitarian institution or um, sort of encourage same-sex marriage on the religious kibbutz. Like that, that, that is something I've never seen. So we see here both um, the sort of trailblazing aspects of the religious kibbutz, but also ways that um, certain social structures, especially around gender, 
are, um, have a, a lot of sticking power. Fascinating, three wonderful answers. Um, I fear that we are running towards the end of our time here. And even though we've had a, a very active chat, a chat that I, I promised to save um, and send to our panelists so that they can cogitate over the questions here, um, I think that it is just about time to draw our proceedings to a close. Um, this is, as, as we've indicated, this is just the first reaping of uh, scholarly activity um, from, from the individuals that you see before you and a wider cohort of their work on the history of the Etrog, and it has already yielded a bountiful harvest. I, I'm sorry, I can't hold myself back from the puns. Um, and so I do want to thank all of our four participants, all of our four panelists and our larger audience, uh, and to all of you attendees. And before we close, I do want to turn the floor over to Professor Shmuel Feiner for some concluding remarks. Um, thank you. Uh, in the name of the Historic Society of Israel, who initiated this event, I would like to thank the speakers for the enlightening talks, our partner, Professor Sarna, and the audience from America, Europe, and Israel. Velechulam, brachot shana tova umetuka. Brachot shana tova umetuka, lechol baeolam. Todaraba, velitraot.